fairly unknown, hungry actors. We had seen a number of terrific women and admittedly, and I don't know why, because they were terrific women, some of the women we had seen, but for some reason, they just didn't fit the house. And I mean, we weren't that far along in our casting, but the house was getting clear. I never thought of that before, but that's what was happening. But we were late in our list of ladies and uh, getting desperate, I guess, and in walks Veronica. And as I think of it now, she was right on for the house, meaning that it wasn't exactly reality. It was heightened reality. It was seeming reality. Because here comes this slender, gorgeous, limousine liberal, which was Mike Kozel's name for her. Here comes this limousine liberal walking into the precinct and fitting the house. And we just all knew it as soon as she walked in. And uh, that was just, you know, a stroke of timing, I suppose, and luck. That was fun. The other characters were fun. I, I remember Bruce, I started to say Willis, Bruce, who played Belker. Whites? Bruce Whites. He came in, we heard him coming down the hall in character as Belker. He came in, he took the script, he jumped up on a table or a desk and auditioned and threw the script down and left as Belker principled, angry at injustice, all of that stuff. And when he had cleared the threshold, Grant said, I'm not going to tell him he can't have the job. <laughs> and that was the Bruce White story. And all the characters came in in a kind of a vivid way that fit the house. Keel Martin I hadn't known before. He, he just seemed like that guy. And uh, Torian Black I hadn't known. He seemed like that guy. That was just a great fortune, fortunate collision of those people. Daniel J. Travanti. Very trained guy in theater. I guess he had done an awful lot of all kinds of things, and I happened not to have known him when he showed up. Um, clearly, as I say, a trained guy, mostly from theater, I presume, because I saw him in a play downtown later. Um, very energized, uh, very, if anything, liable to play with almost too much gunnery, too much force. So the trick is to let him relax as the boss. Maybe that might have been a part of that drill I went through that I mentioned earlier. Let him take easier control rather than forced control. I don't know if much of that is true, but it might have been, and enjoyable, willing, eager, prepared, good guy, good guy. Um, Michael Conrad. Difficult, difficult. Um, fine actor, tremendous regard for acting and actors. And when we would get into a tangle. He wouldn't like some idea that I had. I would sometimes just abandon it because it you know, wasn't worth the fight. And sometimes I would say, Michael, Michael, all I can say is try it. If it's no good, we'll junk it. And he would respond to that. He would say, hey, that's fair enough. We'll give it a whirl. Always kind of difficult, always felt that he was maintaining dignity and principle if he wrestled over items and what I considered to be insignificances. But he didn't feel that way. Difficult, a pain. You know, let's do it. Let's get together and do it and keep going. But that isn't the way he worked. And for him, I was wrong sometimes. For me, he was wrong most of the time. But on we go. James B. Sicking. Good guy, real good guy. Because of his kind of ham handsomeness and dignity, he always, virtually always, wound up playing um, 
the high end of society. I mean, the, the smarter, the, the more fortunate, the, the more wealthy, the more provided for. That's what he played. And uh, so when he got the Howard Hunter part, he was very conditioned to playing superior, to being superior with his glasses and his pipe. And just very skilled and experienced with that guy. He isn't like that. He's a terrific athlete and a good guy. But just because of his physiognomy, that's what he brought, and that's what he often did, and that's what he scored so well with. I remember when he cried, when he discovered Grace reuniting with Big Mike in the locker room. They were kissing. She just, she was coming on to him and saying, please, please, let's put it back together again the way it used to be and Mike couldn't resist her and they wind up in a big kiss and we push back the, push past the kissed kiss to the little glass door in the, the little glass window in the door to the locker room and here Stan sinking with tears beginning to fall down his face. It was just great. Good character, good guy, extremely well done. <laughs> um, talk about Charlie Hayde. Eccentric strong, enthused, good guy, original, different. What is Charlie? Is he an actor? Is he a director? Is he an insurance salesman? Is he an attorney? What is he? He's a different guy. His physiognomy brings us surprise or happy unsureness. We don't know quite what he is. That's what he was. And how interesting and fascinating in the writing that he's a redneck who adored his black partner. And his black partner wasn't black, he was just a guy. But Charlie was a biased redneck. That's an interesting, that's an interesting character to play and he did it wonderfully. And as you remember, very arrogantly and, and very opinionatedly. And yet with his partner, he was a loving, giving guy. He did it very well. And because he's unusual, as an actor in type, it contributed even more to it. Good guy, good, good score. <laughs>